Okay, so I think uh, we're going to get started shortly. Uh, looks like we have a company here. Um, so hi, Bird Gavi. Um, if that's how you pronounce the name, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Bargavi? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, thanks for showing up. I guess this will be more of, oh, there was, we have one more person showing up. Um, but yeah, I guess this will be more of like a little small group session, um, which is great because if you guys have any questions at the end, um, we get, we'll have plenty of time to talk about anything that you might be wondering about. Okay, so I'll just get straight started. Um, so welcome to my seminar called From Average to A Plus, How to Be More Than Typical. My name is Eugene and I am a first year medical student uh, currently studying at UBC. So a little bit about um, reminders about this whole seminar. Uh, it is recorded and uh, in this presentation, uh, just because of time constraints, I'll be presenting general advice. However, I found him to be very helpful. And for those who are interested in individual sessions um, that are more tailored towards your own responses, I'll be providing package information at the end if you are at all interested. And please reach out to me on acceptedtogether.com about any follow-up questions. And also feel free to you know, type out any questions that you may have and just put it up in the chat and I'll make sure to take a look at it once I'm done with the slides. Okay, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Physiology at Western University back in Ontario. Um, and some of the you know, things that I did before coming to med school is I was a student, but also a barista. So the alley, if you don't know, is a pretty popular bubble tea place in Ontario. So I worked there for a couple of years. I was also part of the fencing team at Western um, and I used the uh, EPE as the weapon. Also passionate about just healthy living in general. So uh, going on jogs or going to the gym, uh, mentorship, um, board games and puzzles to get together with people as well as some advocacy work. Um, so one of the major advocacy work that I did back in undergrad was Han Voice, which is a advocacy group for North Korean refugee human crisis here in North America. Um, I interviewed at Queens, McMaster, Ottawa, uh, UBC, and the last two are the schools in the U.S., uh, Wash U and Rochester, and the bolded high, uh, schools there are the ones I was accepted to afterwards. So I just wanted to go through a brief overview of what the MMA actually is. Um, so it's called, uh, it stands for multiple mini interviews. There's about 10 stations total, inclu including rest stations. There'll always be a rest station and it's kind of random which station you'll get is the rest station. Um, each station will last about 10 to 12 minutes. So 10 to 12 minutes out of those minutes, uh, about three minutes or two minutes, you're gonna have to read the question. And after you get that individual time, you'll be put in a Zoom room. Uh, I'm assuming most interviews are held online again this year. You'll be put in a Zoom room with your interviewer where you get to talk about your response and um, maybe you'll talk about your response for about five minutes and then the rest of the time the interviewer will ask you any follow-up questions that they might have. This would be different for, for example, for Queen's MMI where your responses are actually recorded. So there's no like live interview between you and the interviewer. Uh, in that case, there'll just be like a fixed time of you answering the question and the follow-up will be, you know, just another text. Um, and when you do reach the time limit, the station will end automatically. So on, in the context of Zoom interviews, you'll be basically kicked out of the Zoom room. Um, so it's really important that you time yourself. Um, and also remember that each station is um, evaluated independently of each other, which means that no interviewer will see more than one response of yours. Which also means that if you, you know, screw up one station, you still have all the other stations to make up for it. So make sure you don't, uh, you don't panic or you don't uh, fluster because of one bad station. So the types of MMI questions can vary quite a bit. Um, so one of the more major ones is uh, obviously personal. So this would be things like, tell me about a time when you, for example, had to have a difficult conversation with someone else, or tell me about a time when you had to do something uncomfortable. So a lot of these questions will be asking about uh, self-growth. So when you had a difficult time and an obstacle, how did you overcome that obstacle and 
you know, how did you grow from it? Um, you also have ethical scenarios. So for example, uh, say you found out that you, your close friend cheated on an exam uh, to get a higher mark on an exam, what, are, what is your course of action? So in this kind of scenarios, you'd be kind of going over the ethical sides of each side, you know, kind of thinking about why your friend might have done that in the first place versus, you know, how do you talk to your close friend about it uh, without, you know, breaking that relationship, if at all you care about it. And we also have compare and contrast. Um, so for example, let's say an interview question asks you the pros and cons of online education. You kind of just list out a couple points for each and then uh, choose a side at the end. We also have acting stations. Um, so these are very popular among some schools, I would say. Um, so this would be, for example, uh, breaking bad news to people, right? So how do you enter a room and get into a serious conversation without uh, you know, like hurting their feelings or make sure you're not giving any false hopes. Um, there's also stations about current issues. Um, so these are more relevant to, you know, testing your, you know, awareness about what's going on in the world. So for example, if I were to give some examples about uh, the Canadian healthcare system, uh, one of the biggest problems that we're facing right now is the shortage of family physicians in Canada. So maybe they'll ask you like, you know, like, uh, how much do you know about this or what are some ways we can tackle this issue things like that as well as you know um, disparities in terms of healthcare for marginalized communities so how do we deal with the issue of uh, for example black communities or indigenous peoples not being the care that they need or not being able to have you know resources or access to resources um, and then lastly uh, probably you know the biggest news that you've been seeing for the past four years is COVID-19. So maybe they'll ask you about, you know, how it changed um, how healthcare operates or how education operates. Um, so very general, but things that you should know basically. And lastly, uh, we also have abstract stations. Um, so these include like picture stations, uh, very like artsy uh, literature. Um, so a lot of times your answer will be very imaginative. So, um, you'll be able to kind of extract any kind of answer you want. Um, you know, like how does it make you feel? And oftentimes it'll be pretty like symbolic in terms of like social justice, things like that. You know, like, uh, do you see like social inequality or do you see uh, discrimination, things like that. So uh, what are my tips for the MMI in general? Uh, so in general, I would say definitely practicing is literally the most important thing to do. Um, there are these little tricks here and there, but there's nothing more that makes you closer to perfect than practicing. In terms of how to practice, I would uh, recommend practicing in small groups. Uh, so not just one partner and not in a fairly large group, but maybe like four people. The reason being is if you only practice with one other person, uh, the chances are that, you know, that one person has their own perspective, right? And their feedback will kind of, you know, revolve around the perspectives that they have. Whereas if you had multiple perspectives, AKA like practicing with multiple people, they might be able to give you advice that, you know, someone else might not be able to give, right? Um, so, you know, really diversifying your feed, the feedback that you would receive is really important. Um, at the same time, you don't want to practice with too many people because then uh, you'll find that you'll be overwhelmed with, you know, too many like different kinds of, feedbacks and you'll be lost as to, you know, what you're actually supposed to do. Um, and when you are practicing, you know, uh, from one practice to another, make sure that you are building a framework that, you know, you can follow at most times, right? For example, say you have a framework that you are constructing yourself for any ethical scenario, then it won't really matter what the actual dilemma is as long as you're following the same organization. Uh, you don't have to spend as, as much time as to, you know, like worrying about how to structure it. And you can actually spend that extra time to um, work on the content during the two or three minutes preparation that time that you have. You also want to practice your nonverbal communication. Um, so I understand that a lot of this is going to be held in Zoom, so they're not going to see you from waist down. But it's still really important to kind of keep a conversation going or keep an attention from your interviewer, right? And there's nothing better than, you know, having those hand gestures or smiling or 
you know, just like having some kind of a dynamic speech that can grab your interviewer's attention. Um, so definitely practice that. And lastly, timing again is crucial, right? Let's say, for example, you have eight minutes to answer a question and you, you know, you schedule it so that around five minutes of it is your actual answer. Then you have three minutes to work around how to answer your follow-up questions, right? So let's say they ask a follow-up question and you spend, you know, two and a half minutes answering the follow-up question. Then you only have 30 seconds, you know, for the interviewer to ask the follow-up question, another follow-up question, and then for you to answer that follow-up question, right? And so, you know, chances are if you spent two and a half minutes for that initial follow-up question, you won't have time to answer at all for the second one. So, you know, if the follow-up question is like super, you know, important and you want to speak a lot about it, then just use the whole three minutes. Otherwise, keep it at short, you know, one or two minutes or one and a half minutes, right? That way you'll have enough time for another follow-up question. So when I say timing, it's not really just about timing about your actual response, but also timing of how you're answering the follow-up questions as well. Um, and in terms of you know, how you compose yourself, I think it's really important that you, know, you carry yourself with confidence. Um, this is a reminder that you were chosen to be um, part of the interview process. And I would like to congratulate you for that. And I think you should keep on reminding yourself that you were chosen for a reason. They saw, like, they looked at your application and they said, okay, I think this person will be a good fit in our class. So just take a look at your application and you know, think about like what might have stood out for them that they chose you, right? And always remember that you know, they want you and that's why you're there. Make sure you smile, you know, um, you're, you're there to have a conversation, obviously be professional, but you wanna carry that positive energy and spread it to your interviewer. And lastly, don't be afraid to have an opinion, right? Um, we saw earlier about those like ethical dilemma questions, as well as um, the uh, compare and contrast scenarios. It's really easy to kind of give, you know, an overview of both sides and then your final verdict is like, oh, I'm, I think I'm gonna stay somewhere in the middle because I don't have enough information to decide. Now that's an easy answer to give, but it doesn't show enough of your own perspectives and your values to your interviewers. So don't be afraid to choose an opinion, you know, obviously address and acknowledge the other side that you're going against, but don't be, don't be scared to argue. That's what I'm trying to say. And last, and you know, my last point is have some personal examples ready. Um, so, you know, it's always good to have a good structure and good content to an answer, but in the end, the answer is not going to be yours if you don't have anything to relate to, right? For example, if you have an ethical dilemma question and you can come up with an example where you had to go through some kind of an ethical dilemma yourself, that really, you know, tells the interviewer that, wow, like this person really went through the kind of emotions that they're describing right now in the past. And so that really makes it personal. It shows that you're vulnerable and you're ready to share these stories. And so definitely, you know, just think about your life um, and how it built up to, you know, this moment and what are the important moments that you'd like to share with interviewers. Now, I also wanna go over some tips um, for the MMI based on the question type specifically. I found these to be very, very uh, useful for my actual MMI. So for the personal examples, you don't always need to have those like big experiences to in impress your interviewers, right? So for example, if it asks you about, you know, a question that's related to the scholar role, um, or, you know, when you did your research, it doesn't have to be, you know, oh, I did like this research at Harvard, or I, I presented at this like international conference. Um, like, you know, if you do have those experiences, that's great, you know, feel free to share those, but don't be discouraged if you don't have those experiences, right? It's really about how you share your stories, really, and how, you know, how much of the emotions that you can carry within those stories, right? Um, so that being said, be humble. Don't be afraid to, you know, uh, put responsibilities on yourself, um, you know, saying things like, oh, you know, initially, I was afraid or I was very insecure about my body image, for example. But, you know, as time went by or as, as I had these like, conversations with other people, I realized that, 
is not as bad as it seems. So really showing that personal growth by you know setting that starting point where you are like insecure or you're, you're really being vulnerable with your emotions. That's a very good idea to uh, you know in like in uh, kind of involving your personal uh, questions and also show your emotions. Right, you're really telling you know the deepest stories of your life. Um, it'd be weird you know if you're telling these stories and you had like a straight face telling that story. So really get into that moment. And, you know, like all of this is really done by practice. Um, and don't be afraid to show emotions. Uh, for ethical scenarios and compare contrast uh, scenarios, uh, like I said before, choose a side and advocate for it. Um, and secondly, it's a good practice to think about impact on stakeholders. So for example, if, you know, going back to that scenario earlier, um, if you're thinking about impact on stakeholders, uh, when the when the when your close friend is cheating on an exam, the some of the stakeholders that might be involved is your friend themselves, as well as the professor who spent a long time creating that exam and creating the course content to uh, in, enlighten your learning, as well as yourself, right? So if you can kind of think about what kind of impact, whether it's positive or negative impact it has on that stakeholder, it can really help you organize your answer throughout the interview. Um, and the third point is, you know, if you are choosing a side and advocating for it, make sure you're still acknowledging the other party, right? Um, you want to make sure that like, you're not just like blindsided by your own argument and you're only choosing arguments that favor or evidence that's like favoring your own argument. You still want to acknowledge that the other person might argue otherwise. Um, and again, have more personal examples, right? Uh, just make it your own answer. Um, in terms of acting stations, I think it's really important um, to be yourself. Like, how would you actually act in that situation? Um, I think that's very important because it's really, you know, it's really hard to fake emotions, especially when it comes to like empathy, you know? So when it comes to like breaking news, for example, like think about like having to break this news to someone that you like truly love, right? Like, and really like get into that moment because that's what their interviewers want to see that you're able to kind of connect with your patients as a future doctor. And also be a good listener. I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, you know, you're in an interview and you should be kind of showing yourself as much as possible, but a lot, it's, it, it's like, especially for acting stations, you really want to make sure that um, you're telling your advice to whoever you're speaking to, right? You just wanna like, you don't wanna like just say your, whatever you wanna say, it's supposed to be a conversation that's going. So if the other person really has things to say, make sure like you really listen to it, right? Um, unless like the person's like speaking for like a minute straight, then you kinda wanna find a good place to like cut them off. Um, thirdly, uh, you never wanna like panic, right? Um, I get that like acting stations are often the most, you know, unsettling ones, but, um, really just like, and it, and it takes with practice, just know that like, whenever you feel like you're panicking, just remember that you're in one of the most interviews, one of the most important interviews in your life, and you just got to own the moment. Um, the fourth one is kind of redundant, just tailor the conversation to the individual. How you do that is, you know, be a good listener. And lastly, don't overset boundaries. So especially when it comes to like breaking bad news, you know, don't say things like, oh, I know how you feel or, or like I've been there before, like unless you've actually been there, right? Like you don't want to just say things just to make people feel better. Um, you want to just like be straight honest, you know, like I haven't been, I've never been in the situation that, that you've been in right now. And I'm, and I'm truly sorry to hear that. Like that's enough, right? Like you don't have to say, um, I know, I think I know how you feel because you don't. Um, for current issue questions, um, you know, there's no better way of doing this than actually staying up to date with some of the current healthcare issues. Um, some of the uh, things that you can catch up on is podcasts as well as news, uh, or just talking to, you know, other residents and physicians to see what kind of problems that they go through in their everyday lives. Um, real life examples can really help with how might you, how might, how you might tackle a scenario, right? So, if you can come up with a way of how the government is dealing with, you know, the lack of healthcare access, uh, accessibility for indigenous people, um, then that like that's something that you can include in the question where it's asking you to do the same thing. And also uh, be aware of systemic discrimination and disparities in healthcare. 
this will always come out in an interview because it's such a huge social issue. So just like knowing it can is like basically free marks on your interview. Um, lastly, abstract stations revolve with a central theme. Um, so the reason why I say this is because abstract stations are very imaginative. So you can like go from one point from another uh, very fast and chances are like you'll be saying a lot of like blabbish without like actual content. So try to have a central theme, whether that's like resilience, whether that's like equality, something that's like social justice um, that's and like meaningful. That way you can kind of tailor your response around it. Um, and then be creative, right? Like, um, like have a central theme, but also be creative. Like you can say whatever you want as long as you can like connect it to like evidence or your personal experiences. Um, so we can go over a sample MMI scenario. Uh, so let's say you play on a hockey team and you have a, you have a teammate who is also the top scorer of the team, who's also seen at parties doing all sorts of drugs. Your coach decides to drug test you all. And on the day of you, on the day of, you see this player switch their samples with another players. What do you do in this situation? Um, so what I would do is this, so this is kind of like the framework that you would kind of um, construct over time as you practice more is first, just like give a brief summary of the question. Don't just read the entire scenario again, like maybe like one sentence or so, just to like, you know, prime yourself going into the uh, question. And secondly, this is an ethical dilemma question, if you haven't noticed already. So you would go over each side of the dilemma. So the first side, which is very obvious, is the integrity of the sport itself and the other teammate's athlete career. You know, the, uh, the other athlete, uh, the other teammate hasn't done anything wrong. And he's basically a victim of, you know, this person who's trying to, like, switch up the drugs. Um, and you also want to think about the integrity of the sport, you know, like the whole like the meaning of the sport is to have people compete at um, like, you know, at, at like an equal level um, without any like unfair advantages. Um, so that's one side, but you still want to acknowledge the other side where, um, you know, the te first teammate is top scorer of the team. What are the, you know, implications? Like you still want to go over the fact that like, you know, if this person were to be disqualified, then uh, you are still kind of worried about your hockey team's performance as well as, you know, just acknowledging why the top scorer might have done that. You know, maybe he has like alternative reasons. And then you would pick a side, right? Like, so for example, in this case, even though I went over side, both sides A and B, in my opinion, like side B is a lot weaker of an argument. And so I would choose A, you know, like keeping up with the integrity of the sport and caring for the other teammates athlete career. And so after picking a side, you would then have like this conversation that's going, um you know to actually resolve the issue so after you pick the side you're kind of going through a timeline of what you would do and you would also explain why you picked that side right like why did you choose like you know maintaining the integrity of the sport and confronting this teammate as opposed to leaving it alone and so this is where you, your value statement comes in you know like you know say i believe that the integrity of the sport is more important i care about the well-being of the other team as well and then you go through the specific steps of what you would do. So, you know, course of action, uh, it's kind of like Casper. If you haven't done it already, Casper is basically just like uh, how to like address things without escalating the matter too much. So having a, you know, um, like a proper conversation with the person, explain the repercussions of his choice, you know, like think about the other teammate who, who's like athlete career that you're putting in risk. Um, and also have a talk with the coach and the other teammate if the situation escalates. So something like this would be like a timeline, right? So first you would do this, and then if he doesn't listen, then you would do something else. And then lastly, like I said earlier, you want to give like a personal example, maybe if you have one, you know, it doesn't have to be like this exact situation, obviously, but, you know, we're in a situation where you had a choice to turn a blind eye for your close friend, and maybe you chose not to because you had like a value. Uh, so that'd be like a great addition to make. And lastly, uh, you want to just give a summary of like your entire response, you know, um, keep it brief, maybe like 15 to 30 seconds. And then you would, you would be like, oh, thank you. I'd be happy to um, have any, you know, answer any follow-up questions that you might have. So let's say they asked you a follow-up question and they said, oh, what if this player begs you 
not to report him because he has scholarships on the line. So oftentimes this will often be kind of like the type of a follow question that you'll be asked where um, it challenges your values, right? So if there is an, like an external factor, does that change what your decision might be? And a lot of the times my recommendation is that you shouldn't change your initial answer because then you're kind of going against your own value statements, right? Like if, even if his scholarships were on the line, there are many other ways to kind of help him navigate out through the situ like current situation. It still doesn't justify, you know, his choice of kind of throwing his other teammate under the bus. So you would say that, but then instead, you know, like now you've kind of find out that he's going through a tough time. So you give a solution to that, right? Like maybe you offer alternative kind of help, maybe academic support to, um, you know, helping up with like, coursework or like homework, or if it's like financially, then maybe you can help him like find like a job that is like more on the lower commitment side so he can keep up with school as well. Um, so that's really about it. Um, and these are the packages that I'm currently have available on the website, acceptedtogether.com. Um, so what we'd be essentially going through through these and more so about the interview prep sessions for now, because Casper is later in the year. Um, so what we'll be essentially doing is we're going to go through some practice problems. We're going to try and tailor your response, starting off with like organizing your, your answers and then working uh, kind of down like the content as well as, you know, how to approach a similar situation. Um, but yeah, thanks for showing up, guys. I know it's kind of late at night, especially in uh, Eastern Ontario. And good luck on your interviews. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, so do you have any podcasts or news outlets recommendations? Yes. So I think one of them was called um, uh, White Coat, Black Coat. It's on Spotify, as well as if you were to kind of just search up any kind of, if, if you were to go on like Spotify, for example, and search up like medicine podcasts, uh, a lot of them are like very, very useful. I would say like, especially the ones where they have people or like practitioners from like rural areas or people who, who've seen through or seen or has gone through a lot of things. Those are very useful podcasts um, to watch. News, I would say um, just like keep up with whatever's like going on, like literally in terms of like public health, like you don't need to like search around to see news about COVID, right? Or like, the current measures that are being against COVID or like the flu or, you know, just like protests that are going on. For example, if you were to go on like CTV news right now, um, there's actually a huge strike that is going on in England. Um, and it's, you know, about nurses going on a strike. Like that would be like a great example to give in like an ethical scenario where, um, or like just a general question about, you know, whether healthcare professionals should strike or not, right? So uh, just like keep updated. It, like you could literally just watch it on YouTube as well. But I'd say like for me, I use mainly Spotify. Um, does McMaster have active stations as well? Um, I think historically, yes. Um, so I would like, if I were interviewing for McMaster, I would definitely, I would definitely practice acting stations. I can't speak for myself just because of the confidentiality, but I think historically people have said that they've been a lot of acting. So my recommendation is that you should practice acting. Uh, any other questions? And you know, like if you do have any questions that come up after this seminar, feel free to reach out to me on acceptedtogether.com. You can just search up my name and you'll find me there. So yes, Jason, that is a very good point. Um, yeah, like literally like just talking about job conditions and you can, you know, think about like the, the downstream consequences of that, right? Like what is the impact of, you know, healthcare professionals not being satisfied with their work conditions, right? Like it reduces quality of care, um, you know, working in a healthcare system, doctors are supposed to have this like long-term relationship with patients. 
And if they're not, you know, happy interacting with patients or they're not able to work their fullest, um, then the quality of care goes down, you know, the long-term relationship goes down, the trust relationship. And so if you have, you know, like a real life example, you can always connect that to so many new ideas. Um, how did you manage keeping up your GPA with school, work, and social life? So I would say that's, that's a very good question. I would say that um, really having, uh, like scheduling yourself out, I would say, for example, let's say you're a person who goes to all of your classes, right? Which is something that I did as well before COVID hit. Um, you know, it's really hard to like kind of navigate yourself out throughout the schedule. I would say like, to like have blocks of studying that, you know, like you're really gonna like focus and sit on your desk and I'm gonna study this subject for an hour, right? So really have those blocks set out and schedule yourself ahead before exams, right? Um, and so like, you know, that way you can like pace yourself. I think a lot of the work that we do in university or a lot of the work that that we need to do in university is like self-management. And a lot of that means like, you know, pacing yourself. Are you being overpaced um, or are you being underpaced? And so what I did to myself is I felt like just going to school and coming back and doing homework or being part of a couple clubs was not enough of a stimulation for me. So what I did is I started working at the alley, as I said earlier, and I slowly increased my workload throughout the weeks, right? And so I'm slowly increasing the total in intensity or, you know, how packed my schedule is every week until it feels like, you know, I really have to like stay on top of my work. So what, what like where that threshold is, whether it's like high up there or low there, um, is really individual independent. Um, but I would also point out that like, even if you have like a lower threshold for like burnout, there's still ways to like work around that, right? So for example, make sure you have like a support system um, where you don't feel like stressed out by yourself. Um, like for example, like even studying, it can be a lot more enjoyable when you're studying in like a smaller group setting and you're like actually explaining concepts to each other rather than you just like looking through the textbook and you're like confused and you're like, you know, really stressed about yourself. And so even just like, you know, changing the way you study, for example, can really um, have a great impact on how you can manage time. Um, now, in terms of like work and social life, um, I would say that like go into like the work industry that is not like that is flexible, for example, like there's, for example, back at Western, we had a lot of like these jobs that we could we could get near the school. And since those like uh, workplaces were already used to having student employees, they were a lot more flexible with like the hours that we worked, as well as like the job conditions were much more like organized and things like that. So really just choosing the right job to work um, is I would say very important. And in social life, you know, um, it doesn't have to be like going out, right? Like um, just find whatever you like to enjoy. So like I said earlier, one of the main ways that I made friends in undergrad was literally just having like board game sessions back in our place. And it doesn't even have to be that much, maybe like once a week on Friday nights uh, for like three hours. Um, and that's like the way I got closer with my friends. And yeah, like, um, you know, and if you, if you're like consciously aware that every Friday night, I'm going to hold a board game night, then you start to actually like manage the rest of your schedule throughout the week to make sure that by the time it's Friday, you're not like overwhelmed with any kind of work. Does that make sense? Um, what's the what's your opinion on the provincial government moving fifty percent of surgeries to private uh, healthcare sector? Um, so that's a great question. That this would be a, like if, for example, this was a MMI question, it would be like a compare contrast question. Um, so there's a lot of benefits, and you know. Um, kind of drawbacks into having things in a private sector in the first place, right? One of the good things is that it encourages competition. And so uh, the downstream effect of that is like people get to, hopefully people get to have surgeries um, earlier than what it is right now. Um, because the current state of healthcare is that 
you know, a lot of the patients, even getting an MRI to see where the actual problem is, is already very difficult. So they would have to wait for like two, three years just to get an MRI and, and then they would get a diagnosis and then they start, they, and then they get put on another wait list for the treatment, right? So if you look at the problem of that, well, then for example, if someone had like cancer, like that would be a very anxiety inducing two or three years of just waiting, right? So that's one of the biggest drawbacks of having a public healthcare system is that everyone has to wait for a long periods of time unless it's an emergency. And the thing about cancer surgery is that they're actually not considered emergencies. Um, so that's a huge problem. Um, and so having a private care sector would kind of encourage, you know, people having lower prices, having more availabilities um, to make sure that people are getting the proper care um, at the time that they need. At the same time, though, um, you know, there's obviously benefits of having a public healthcare sector, um, which is that everyone gets like accessible, you know, everyone has like access to healthcare in the first place. And so if you think about the privatization of healthcare surgeries, you know, then we start to think about, you know, what, if, what about the marginalized communities that weren't able to get, they were, that were able to get surgery before, but now they can't because of the increased costs, right? Like who, who takes care of them, right? So those are the things that we need, to talk, we need to think about, right? Is that, is this decision even making, is this like making the disparity of healthcare between different communities even worse? Right. Um, so those are things that the factors that you would kind of think about. Right. So compare and contrast. And then maybe you choose a side. Right. Maybe I choose a side, say that, oh, um, so my opinion would be that I actually do agree with 50 percent of surgeries going to private healthcare sector. And then I would give a private like a personal example. And the reason being is, for example, I had my mom had wrist problems. Uh, for a couple of years, but she never even got to get an MRI um, for so many years and her symptoms just got worse every year. And she felt really terrible about the healthcare system and her general like performance and her quality of life just decreased every year. And for me, that was kind of one of the main frustrations I had against the public healthcare system. The fact that if a problem was bad enough, the only choice you really have is to travel out of Canada where there is a private healthcare system. Um, and so I would agree that like, you know, if we were to have this, you know, option of going privatization and people got their surgery sooner to kind of prevent any further problems, then I think it's actually a good decision. And at this point, you would actually acknowledge the other side, right? Like the point that I mentioned about marginalized communities, how do you deal with that? Right. And so I would say something like, now I understand that decision, this decision might make, put some communities at risk for uh, poor quality of care because they might not be able to, able to afford private surgeries. Um, and one of the ways that I can think of to kind of tackle this problem also is to kind of have subsidizations or, you know, sponsorships that are readily available for marginalized communities. That way they can get like equitable healthcare systems, even when it turns private. So that's like the general outline of my answer would be, right? So I would kind of give the pros and cons of, you know, uh, private health, uh, privatization of uh, surgical healthcare, and then I would choose a side, but still acknowledge the other side, and then you know give a summary at the end. Was that good of a response? Any other questions? Okay, perfect. If there's no other questions, um, I'll end the session here. But, you know, like I said earlier, if you did have any additional questions, just reach me out on this website and uh, I'll be able to reach out. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. It was really helpful. No worries. Best of luck on your interviews.